Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is chapter one, Dissecting the Laboring Body, Frankenstein, Political Anatomy, and the Rise of Capitalism. This is part two of chapter one because it is long. Okay. Political Anatomy, Wage Labor, and Destruction of the English Commons. It is often forgotten that capitalism fully emerges only where older communal forms of economic life have disintegrated, or more accurately, perhaps, where they have been dissected. For capitalism to develop, customary ties between people and the land must be severed and communal obligations among people disrupted. Throughout most of recorded history, the majority of human beings have lived as peasants organized into family units whose members work the land collectively, usually along patriarchal lines, and share resources within the community. Access to land in such societies generally require the performance of services for powerful lords and masters. But on such terms, such access was usually heritable. Peasants thus typically possessed land as their primary means of producing the goods of life and often enjoyed access to common lands open to nearly all members of the village community. The subsistence of people in such rural societies was largely secured, therefore, without recourse to the market. Because almost every household held land and usually had access to communal lands as well, they could directly procure the foodstuffs, fuel, and materials necessary for survival barring drought or violent appropriation of their produce. While people might go to the market to sell, to sell surplus goods and acquire specific items, their survival did not depend upon market transactions. Capitalism, by contrast, is a society of systematic market dependence, one in which survival depends upon individuals finding a buyer for a good or service, usually labor, that they offer on the market. What distinguishes capitalism, therefore, is not the existence of markets, but the unique imperatives of market compulsion in which owners and laborers have no means of reproducing themselves other than by selling and buying. And for the majority of people, such compulsion arises only where they, they have been detached from direct access to the means of life of the sort provided by family plots in common lands. Once the majority is so subjected to markets, including the market in labor, people become both regular sellers of their labor power and regular buyers of the subsistence goods they require. Capitalists too become market dependent. They purchase their means of production, labor, raw materials, tools, and machines on the market, just as they sell their, the goods where production they super, whose production they supervise. Although the market experience is radically different for each group, a potential source of profit for the capitalist and a constant site of exploitation for the worker, it is the central regulator of social economic life for both. The rise of such a market system required the destruction of the older village economy, whose death knell was sounded with the widespread enclosure of land, particularly common lands, and the extinction of the open field system. At the most basic level, enclosure involved a spatial reorganization of land ownership and use. The traditional feudal economy had been organized around the Lord's Manor, with most land in the hands of peasants who held leases, usually as either freeholders or copyholders, whose terms and obligations were outlined in manor documents, and were obliged to pay rents and services to their Lord. Family holdings were often geographically dispersed, a given owner possessing scattered strips of land, and much land was organized as open fields available to the entire village community after harvest and in fallow seasons. In addition to open fields, the manorial economy contained common fields, forests, and wastes, where any inhabitant could graze livestock, hunt, fish, pick fruit, berries, and herbs, glean grain, gather wood for both building materials and fuel, as well as peat, coal, and stones, and pick bulrushes that could be woven into mats, baskets, seats for chairs, or used for bedding. 
These rights of the community, or of most of its members, were regulated by an assembly of cultivators, either the manor court or a gathering of the village community. The reader may have noticed that I have used the word held rather than owned in my description of peasant possession of land. Under classical feudal law, all land belonged to the king of the realm. Individuals, including lords, had rights to use to use land only if they rendered proper service to their superiors. Rights to property were thus conditional. The idea of absolute private property simply had no place in such a society. Indeed, historians have been unable to find a clear definition of property in English legal writings prior to the 18th century. Nevertheless, long leases, which were typical in the period 1450 to 1700, gave peasant households a stability of possession, and their common rights gave them an enduring sense of community membership. Moreover, because privately held fields were generally open and sometimes subject to a variety of communal rights, the peasant economy was both public and shared. The early enclosure movement initiated a long process by which common rights and the open field economy were displaced by capitalist forms of private property. Not that any of this could have been clear at the outset to those wealthy tenant freeholders in search of larger farms or lords looking for higher rents, each of whom began to concentrate in enclosed land. Yet in, facil in facilitating the construction of spatially unified properties, bounded by hedges and fences, the first enclosures began the dissolution of communal rights. Spatial concentration of land may have made possible the application of new techniques, which were often cost-effective only if applied on a relatively large scale. But it also went hand-in-hand -hand with its social concentration as poor peasants were, brought, were bought out. Often when land was demanded as debt payment, defrauded of land in cases where there were no written records of their tenancies or forced out by jacked up rents or entry fees when leases expired. In arranging local enclosures to the benefit of wealthy tenants, lords deepened divisions within the village community, exacerbating the disparity between rich and poor peasants and weakening the capacities of communities to resist collectively. As some of the earliest enclosures Rich tenants or yeomen also undermined their poorest neighbors, for whom enclosure was frequently disastrous. By 1500, almost half of England was enclosed, but in addition to spatially enclosing, landlords also engrossed amassing every larger, ever larger amounts of land under their direct control. Lands that had for centuries been subject to communal customs let out to peasant households that, in return for rent and service, received legal and military protection, as well as use of land and common rights, or commons rights, were now treated as market assets to be rented to the highest bidder, usually wealthy farmers who hired rural wage laborers. The result was land hunger for the dwarf and family, family farmers while the capitalist farmers bid against each other for the tenancies of medium and large farms able to return high profits. As enclosure picked up steam over the next 150 years, more and more poor peasants found their old way of life disappearing in the wake of the new class structure emerging in the countryside. The upshot was a growing class of semi-proletarianized cottagers who, lacking holdings adequate to support their families, and deprived of common rights, increasingly resorted to wage labor. Following the period of civil war and revolution, 1640 to 60, landlords re remobilized, enclosing fully one third of all English lands in the century after 1660. The scale of the transformation that occurred over 150 years was staggering. Whereas peasants had occupied two thirds of all lands at the Restoration, 1660, they held, they held a mere 10% by the end of the next century. But the process w was far from over since growing numbers of lords were setting their sights on the vast commons, perhaps a quarter of all English land where peasants had rights to hunt, fish, pick fruit and berries, gather wood and graze animals.
all entitlements without which millions could not have supported themselves and their families, given the meagerness of their land holdings. The resulting wave of parliamentary enclosure in which landowners introduced bills in Parliament seeking legislative authority, which they readily received to enclose common lands around their estates, saw further 6 million acres privatized between 1760 and 1830. Enclosure and engrossment radically transformed both class and gender relations. Their combined effect was to push poor peasants onto smaller and less fertile morsels of land, forcing them into occasional, seasonal, and sometimes permanent labor for wages. Whereas only 12% of English peasants engaged in wage labor in 1550, by 1640 the figure was in the range of 40%, and over 50% by 1688. With the privatization of commons, peasant households which had managed to survive on small plots and cottagers who subsisted on little more than a garden, thanks to the self-provisioning made possible by customary rights to game, fish, berries, and wood from common lands, now lost indispensable means of, sur of survival, and these transformations registered powerful gendered effects. Many forms of production on the commons, gleaning, gathering of fruit, berries, nuts, wood, and turfs, and milking of cows that, that grazed on common lands were performed by women, often with the assistance of their children. The products of these labors both fed the household. In fact, milk disappeared from many poor families' diets after enclosure of commons eliminated their grazing rights and fetched money on the market. In both these ways, labor on the commons significantly reduced the dependence of the household on wages. A cow, for instance, could be worth almost half the annual wages of a laboring man. Not surprisingly then, male workers frequently refused wage labor in order to contribute to household work on the family plot or the commons, but such refusals became less and less viable as the commons disappeared, and wage dependence became the order of the day. Simultaneously, the economic contributions of women to the reproduction of the household contracted and household contracted and new gender relations emerged. For many of the English, po English poor, enclosure of the commons thus represented a point of no return after which the only alternatives to wage labor were theft and begging. Many certainly tried their hands at these, but increasingly draconian laws against theft and vagrancy rendered such strategies more and more unattractive. Squeezed unrelentingly, the English peasantry metamorphosed into a rural proletariat. Evidence indicates, writes one historian of rural England, that in most of the important industrial and forested areas of 17th century England, the cottagers had ceased to be peasants and had become members of a rural proletariat a process that both accelerated and widened after parliamentary enclosure of common lands. The transformation from peasants to proletarians signified nothing less than a socio-economic revolution, one which ushered in the world's first capitalist society. And the driving force was clearly the transformation of property relations, particularly the destruction of the common lands, not demographic growth. Indeed, while the English population grew sevenfold between 1520 and 1850, the proletariat, those reliant on wages, grew perhaps 23-fold. As we might expect, this transformation was often registered in the conceptual language of anatomy and monstrosity. For the poor, of course, the loss of land and commons and the pauperization these produced was truly monstrous. For the ruling class, it was stubborn, sometimes violent, resistance to enclosure, privatization, and marketization that comprised a monstrous threat to societal well-being. And in the pamphlet wars and social conflicts in which the discourse of monstrosity was contested, anatomy provided a salient discursive frame. Throughout the centuries of enclosure, after all, land was persistently anatomized mapped, measured, cut up, enclosed, reassembled. If before 1500 local maps were rare, by the end of the 16th century, a near craze for map making had emerged as the ruling class sought to document the topography of private ownership. In opposition to custom and annual perambulations, 
in which field and village boundaries were committed to collective memory, maps provided the figurative system that represented the new geography of private power. Not surprisingly, the term political anatomy emerged during the 1650s, as the new order of property gave rise to an unprecedented cartography of English lands. It is especially instructive that political anatomy made its appearance in the title of a work devoted to Cromwellian and restoration efforts to measure, chart, and expropriate the lands of Irish Catholics in order to distribute them to English landowners. Mapping had been a central technology for the assertion of English power in Ireland since the 16th century, and anatomy became the discursive frame in which the cutting up of Irish society was described and analyzed. The same technology of power and representation was applied to English lands. As we have seen, it was not just the physical lands landscape of rural England that was radically altered in this way. More significant was the transformation of social geography. Land had long been an extension of people. People and their village and kinship networks were grounded in concrete places and spaces and truly inconceivable outside the land of which they were a part and which was a part of them. The bourgeois sense of self and enclosed individuated personality, strictly demarcated from others and from the world around it, had no place in such a community, nor did the classical notion of the enclosed body. Instead, the popular body was conceived as open, untidy, and fluid, and to an emergent ruling class intent on enforcing order, establishing limits and distinctions, and defending privatized property, this expansive body of the common people assumed a grotesque character. In the era of, of ascendant capitalism, the non-enclosed body appeared to them as monstrous, unfinished, and transgressive, an intrusive, invasive thing, not separated from the world by clearly defined boundaries. For the ruling class, all that was common was dangerous, unruly, subversive, the common people as much as common lands. Indeed, the word commons was used to denote both lands and people, a semantic slippage that highlights the very lack of demarcation between people and land that was at issue. Just as commons referred to land that was unenclosed and communal, land that defied the exclusive rights of private property, so it also referred to the uncivilized poor, the unruly commoners. We can get no work, nor have we no money, the rebellious woolen weaver Edward White report reportedly intoned in 1566. But we will have a remedy one of these days, or else we will lose all, for the commons will rise. For these sentiments, he and three others were hanged. The same usage repeatedly makes its appearance in the drama and literature of the era. In his part, two of King Henry VI, a play I discuss below, Shakespeare presents us with rebel leader Jack Cade, exhorting his followers with the words, You that love the commons, follow me. Such evidence suggests that the lower orders embrace the term, and, at least implicitly, affirmed common property as integral to a plebeian, non-enclosed sense of self. As capitalism restructured patriarchal relations, this non-enclosed body of the common people was given both a class and a gender identity. While the bourgeois male self was constructed as a possessive individualist, owner of a demarcated enclosed body and possessor of property and the rights that accrued to it, the body of the common people was feminized and animalized, treated as a deficient type, a leaky vessel inadequately separated, differentiated, and defined. The idealized bourgeois male body was constructed as an appropriating unit, an accumulator of privatized property, while the demonized, feminized body of the commons was a dangerously porous one, seeping into enclosed spaces, transgressing limits and boundaries. This delineation of the grotesque body of the people was unwritten by the active role of women in many anti-enclosure riots, an indication that rebellious women did not know their place, or perhaps knew it all too well, both geographically and socially. In fact, during the years of the English Civil War, female, female rebellion manifest in challenges to religious hierarchy and gender roles was directly linked to anti-enclosure riots. <clears throat> 
The women in this country begin to rise, bemoaned one frightened commentator in 1642. I wish you all to take heed of women, for this very vermin have pulled down an enclosure. In its campaign to impose social order, the ruling class persistently feminized this untidy, spatially rambunctious body of the people, identifying women with unruliness, even ungodliness. Aided by prosperous men of the middling sort, England's rulers sought to impose more sharply patriarchal gender relations. A war against riotous women was launched with particular vigor during the period 1560 to 1640. In an effort to rigid, rigidify gender norms, persecute communal practice, and suppress rebellion. Assertive women were demonized, publicly ridiculed, as in Shakespeare's Taming of the Shrew, and punished by mechanisms such as the cucking stool, a teeter-totter type apparatus for ducking offenders in rivers or ponds. In contrast with much of Europe, England or English trials against accused witches seem to have revolved most frequently around their ins insistence on communal obligations to alms from neighbors in particular, but also to rights to glean and to gain access to the commons. As individualized notions of property took hold and many villagers refused older communal responsibilities, claims to traditional rights were depicted not only as illegitimate, but as evil. At the same time, to aver possession of occult powers was often the only weapon remaining to poor women, particularly the elderly and widows, the only means with which they might back up demands for observance of customary entitlements. In persecuting witches and imposing ever more rigid gender roles, the wealthy were thereby attacking communal practices and identifying them with monstrous women. Like communal lands, then, the common people were portrayed as wild, open, primitive, and uncontrolled, and none more than poor women. Civilizing the poor thus required the particularizing procedures of political anatomy, separating them from their land and communal rights, closing off their leaky, feminized bodies, and the non-private entitlements they sought in order to reconstitute them as discrete property owners of labor power, forced to rely on their individual market resources. The poor generally experienced all of this as little more than monstrous destruction, as a demonic process by which they and their communities were dissected and devoured. Enclosures, wrote Philip Stubbs in a book pro provocatively titled Anatomy of the Abuses in England, 1583, have created a horror in which rich men eat up poor men as beasts do eat grass. In invoking images of the rich as beastly and cannibalistic annihilators of the poor, Stubbs contributed to the secularization and politicization of the discourse of monstrosity. No longer imagined as ghosts, spirits, or bizarre beings from unknown realms, monsters were here pictured as fully human and close at hand. Their defects were social, not natural in character. What characterizes monstrous humans in such a discourse is their role as destroyers of social bonds and obligations. To violate communal obligations, Shakespeare will suggest, is to challenge fate, to invite tragedy. And this was so for both sides in the polemics over enclosure and the new economics, which became a staging ground for just such a secularized discourse of monstrosity. If enclosure became identified in the eyes of the poor with cannibalism, the rich eating the poor, for the rich, the anti-enclosure riot came to symbolize monstrous transgressions against property, law, church, and state. Across these decades, a new grammar of monstrosity thus emerged as a secular rhetoric of social contestation, a shift encapsulated in Samuel Purchase's contention in the early 17th century that man himself is this monster. And in the era of the English Civil War, these new idioms of monstrosity were to become crucial rhetorical figures through which struggles over political power were played out, only to be reworked and reanimated as means of interpreting, interpreting the conflicts of the French Revolution, nearly a century and a half later. But throughout the early modern period, the secular stream of the discourse of monstrosity never lost contact with the debate over enclosure. <laughs>
With their livelihoods and communal properties under siege, the resistance of the poor flared into violence throughout the Tudor area, or era. As they tore down fences, trampled hedges, invaded forests and fields. The enclosure riot, notes one historian, remained the preeminent form of social protest during the period from 1530 to 1640. In the face of the relentless pressures of enclosure, ever-growing numbers of the poor gravitated to the, those remaining sites where subsistence and sociality could be enjoyed. Forests and commons became the refuge of a variety of rebels and outcasts, squatters, highwaymen, itinerant craftspeople, and day laborers. These spaces nourished a rebellious popular culture and rugged practices of, commun of communalism. At moments of social upheaval, these practices could assume a more explicitly political expression, as during Kett's Rebellion of 1649, when tens of thousands of rebels set up campsites across lowland England and demanded that henceforth no man shall enclose any more. Not surprisingly, restoration of the commons was the central motif of all radicalism of the period, enjoying a utopian inflation at the hands of the most revolutionary dissenters, for whom all private property was illegitimate and common property the solution to society's ills. But just as the poor rallied to defend and sometimes extend the commons, the dominant classes depicted them as nests of evil and corruption. An alarmed King James warned in 1610 that the multiplying cottages to be found in forests and commons were nurseries and receptacles of thieves, rogues, and beggars. Forty years later, an anonymous pamphleteer elaborated the political threat posed by these gardens of thieves, proclaiming that common fields are the seat of disorder, the seed plot of contention, the nursery of beggary. The commons thus became sites of contesting monstrosity, breeding grounds of insolence, crime and rebellion in the eyes of elites, cherished buffers against the de de deep depredations of the market economy for the poor. Of course, the victors painted their dissection of the old village economy in noble terms, lauding its destruction as a great moral improvement. The privatization of the commons was presented, as it is today in the era of, ne of neoliberal capitalism, as a cure for the intractability of the poor, a means to propel them into the age of indust industry and improvement. One 17th century advocate urged that enclosure will give the poor an interest in toiling. By depriving them of subsistence, it would thus accomplish what terror could not. Rapacious property grabs and the crushing of common rights and village customs assumed the robes of a momentous civilizing mission. Rather than sources of new profits, enclosure and wage labor were extolled as cures for the laziness and insubordination of the lower classes, as tonics that would render the poor industrious and respectable. The use of common lands by laborers operates upon the mind as a sort of independence, bemoaned a Mr. Bishton to the Board of Agriculture in 1794. Elimination of the commons would, however, break the spirit of independence and ensure that the, lab that the laborers will work every day in the year, that their children will be put out to labor early, and that the subordination of the lower ranks would be secured. The moral improvement of the poor thus became synonymous with their subordination to the disciplines of wage labor. Cottages, gardens, and common lands became markers of laxity and insubordination, of resistance to the uplifting rigors of waged, lab waged work. In a sly semantic move, independence and self-sufficiency were cast as obstacles to moral progress, and respectability framed in terms of dependence on one's betters. The campaign to destroy communal property and enthrone capitalist property rights assumed its moral coloration in these discursive terms. And while the debate was first framed in relation to land, it was readily extended to cover other rights to non-capitalist property. The struggle over wood chips offers a compelling case in point. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, workers in England regularly exercised claims to a variety of industrial goods and byproducts. 
In shipbuilding, labor is the preparation of chips, scraps, and waste produced in the course of hewing, chopping, and sawing ship timbers, which had been a customary right since 1634, augmented money wages by a third to a half, much being sold for firewood. However, the Navy, the great employer of shipyard labor, loathed the practice of chips, a term which referred as much to the workers' right of appropriation as to the wooden bits themselves. In this, the Navy embodied the emergent logic of capital and its hostility to all notions of workers' rights to any of the pr products, and including byproducts, of their labor. At the heart of capitalism, after all, is the complete separation, alienation of workers from the means of production and the products of labor. All of which, all of which adhere to capital by virtue of its property rights. The pure form of capital is established where workers' subsistence is derived from money wages alone. But industrial byproducts buffered workers from the pressures of total proletarianization by providing economic resources outside the matrix of the wage relation. In treating some of the products of labor, chips, as non-capitalist property, workers subjected these products to dual claims, setting the stage for intense battles between contending rights to property. Using Parliament and the courts, the Navy was able throughout the 1790s to redefine more and more cases of chip-taking as theft, pushing all the time for harsher punishments. In 1795, Samuel Bentham was appointed Inspector General of the Naval Works. In the utilitarian spirit of his famous brother, he quickly drew up an anatomy of shipbuilding, defining the multiple operations and procedures by which wood was worked into ships, reorganizing the labor process on scientific lines, and introducing machines wherever possible. At the same time, he introduced shift work on a 24-hour schedule, and despite resistance in the form of a mass strike, established piecework in 1801, the very year the custom of chips was finally eliminated. Here again, the establishment of fully capitalist property relations rested on criminalizing workers' customary property rights, and chips were not the only form of non-capitalist property so contested. Similar battles were fought over weavers' rights to thrums, the weft ends left on the loom after the removal of finished cloth or cloth or over the practices through which porters, seamen, and coopers socked or pocketed bits of the tobacco they packed, loaded and unloaded on ships. In one trade after another, masters and employers formed associations for the prosecution of embezzlement, modeled on those mounted by the rural gentry to enforce game, game laws and prosecute poachers. Deploying inspectors to search workers' homes for stolen materials, these associations also provided masters with funds for, for prosecutions. And as more workers were prosecuted, so were they also subjected to st stiffer sentences. By 1777, the penalty for embezzlement was increased from two weeks to three months in a house of correction. Part and parcel of the destruction of customary rights then was a new legal code that, by outlying outlawing all non-market claims to wealth, subordinated workers ever more powerfully to the regimes of wage labor. As customary property rights lost protection under the law, previously sanctioned practices were transformed into criminal offenses. Workers invariably resisted the redrawing of these boundaries between the legitimate and Ill the illegitimate glorifying in theft and pilfering while symbolically trampling down these new hedges and enclosures. In response, stiffer punishment, punishments were introduced, new police forces constructed, and new prisons built, all in an effort to force compliance. The gambit of laws and punishments enacted to secure this regime and to criminalize practices of resistance is staggering. The Riot Act, 1715, designed to clamp down on all public disturbances, the Transportation Act 1719, which instituted deportation of felons for purposes of slave labor on West Indian or North American plantations, the Combination Act 1721, whose purpose was to criminalize workers' associations, 
the Workhouse Act 1723, by which parishes could set up workhouses to confine the poor and their offspring and put them to forced labor. The Notorious Black Act 1723 and the Vagrancy Act of 1744. Not only did these new laws outlaw a wide range of social activities, public protest, worker organization, begging, hunting, and fishing on former common lands. They also introduced draconian punishments for their transgression. The number of offenses punishable by death rose ominously and persistently during the consolidation of agrarian and industrial capitalism. From about 50 to 1688 to 160 by the middle of the 18th century and to about 220 early in the next century virtually all of them having to do with crimes against property. The Black Act, which criminalized various acts of hunting, stealing, and poaching from forests, as well as the felling of trees, created more than 50 new offenses subject to capital punishment, making it one of the most punitive pieces of legislation passed by any legislature anywhere. That these laws were designed in large measure to compel the poor to accept the rigors of wage labor was never in doubt to their framers. Game laws, for instance, often opened with preambles like the following, which bemoaned the great mischief which do ensue by inferior tradesmen, apprentices, and other dissolute persons neglecting their trades and employments who follow hunting, fishing, and, of, and other game to the ruin of themselves and their neighbors. In defiance of this onslaught against customary economies, the poor displayed a stubborn preference for survival strategies that evaded the disciplines of the market. Determined to close off all such options, legislatures or legislators used the 1744 Vagrancy Act to endow magistrates with the power to whip or imprison beggars, peddlers, gamblers, strolling actors, gypsies, and all those who refused to work for the usual and common wages. As if this were not enough, the act also conferred to them authority to imprison all persons wandering abroad in lodging in alehouses, barns and houses, or in the open air, not giving a good count of themselves. Interestingly, it also extended vagrancy to end gatherers, i.e. individuals who traveled about collecting odd bits of cloth or wool. As adjunct to this harsh criminal code, the ruling class built new prisons to house the growing army of transgressors. At the same time, it sought to equip the law with new terrors. To this end, it enlisted the services of anatomy. Anatomy in the Corpse Economy The English ruling class did not grasp the punitive possibilities of dissection as early as its counterparts elsewhere. But having done so, it refined punitive anatomy into an ominous weapon of class discipline. In 1540, Henry VIII conferred on the newly united companions of barbers and surgeons the right to four corpses of hanged felons annually. In the next century, Charles II hiked the group's annual entitlement to six corpses. Through these royal enactments, anatomy became part of the repressive armory of the state and public dissection of felons part of the theater of power. It is especially intriguing that the blueprint for London's first permanent anatomy theater, theater was drawn up in 1636 by Inigo Jones, who had designed the city's Phoenix Playhouse and was perhaps the most celebrated designer of masks and spectacles of the day. Public anatomy was deliberately organized as dramatic performance and mounted in theaters in the round that simultaneously entertained, instructed, and warned all the while re reproducing forms of class authority. And as poverty grew with the rise of capitalism, so did the numbers threatened with punitive dissection. The whole drift of English social policy throughout the 17th and 18th centuries was toward treating poverty as an offense against the laws of nature and the market. To be desperately poor was to be insubordinate, to refuse to adapt to the market economy in this spirit Poor law policy increasingly punished the destitute for their indiscipline and soon enlisted dissection to this end. In 1694, the London Town Council for the first time decreed that abandoned bodies of the poor found dead in the street or unclaimed after violent deaths 
could be provided to the anatomists. Still, as anatomy boomed and medical education increasingly emphasized direct experience of dissection, the supply of corpses failed to keep pace. The result was twofold. First, a steady rise in the price of corpses, which more than tripled in the 20 years after 1720. And second, considerable growth in the practices by which they were illicitly procured, grave robbing, murder, and the purchase from relatives and friends of the bodies of the condemned on hanging days at Newgate. By the 1720s, corpse stealing had become a full-time profession whose practitioners, known as resurrectionists, can make a comfortable living. And as the market increased, so did evidence of murder, particularly of street youth, in order to sell their corpses for dissection. The result was a corpse economy in which human bodies, increasingly commodified in life, assumed in death the status of commodities pure and simple. So extreme was the reification involved that a corpse intended for the market was dubbed a thing. In this spirit, the commodity corpse was subjected to pricing policies as subtle as those applied to most goods. During the 1790s, for instance, one gang of resurrectionists listed separate prices for the corpses of adults and children. The latter selling for six shillings for the first foot and nine pence for every inch beyond that. Alongside prices for specific organs and body parts known as offcuts. As Richardson observes, corpses were bought and sold. They were touted, priced, haggled over, negotiated for, discussed in terms of supply and demand, delivered, imported, exported, transported. Human bodies were compressed into boxes, packed in sawdust, packed in hay, trussed up in sacks, roped up like hams, sewn in canvas, packed in cases, casks, barrels, crates, and hampers, salted, pickled, or injected with preservative. Human bodies were dismembered and sold in pieces or measured and sold by the inch. By granting judges and murder trials discretion to substitute dissection for gib gibbeting in chains, the Murder Act of 1752 augmented the supply of corpses and, dro and drove down their price, at least for a while, since demand kept rising. What with four hospital medical schools, 17 private anatomy schools, and countless private dissection courses all in the market. But any loss to the resurrectionists in terms of income represented a gain to the state in the form of an alarming new capacity of the law to terrorize. Echoing Mandeville, the text of the Murder Act described dissection as a further terror and peculiar mark of infamy, thus underlining its punitive rather than scientific inspiration. Equally significant in an attempt to clamp down on the riots against the surgeons, it also declared rescue or attempted rescue of a corpse to be punishable by transportation to the colonies or American plantations for seven years return before such time being punishable by death. That the punitive nature of public dissection was never in doubt can be gleaned from observing William Hogarth's famous 1751 illustration, The Reward of Cruelty. Let us start with its accompanying text before analyzing the illustration itself. Behold the villain's dire disgrace, not death itself can end. He finds no peaceful burial place, his breathless corpse no friend. Torn from the root that wicked tongue which daily swore and cursed, those eyeballs from the sockets wrung that glowed with lawless lust, his heart exposed to prying eyes to pity has no claim, but dreadful from his bones shall rise his monument to shame. Several interconnected themes animate these verses. First, there's the notion that death itself is not the end of punishment. After expiring, the villain's body will know neither peace nor friend. One encounters, second, a description of anim an anatomized body parts, tongue, eyeballs, heart, which is clearly meant to be both frightening and demeaning. Finally, a discourse of disgrace and shame runs throughout, underlining the publicity of the criminal's humiliation. Exposed to prying eyes, bereft of pity, the corpse is subjected to scorn and contempt. 
I shall return to some of these themes shortly, but let us now turn to the illustration itself, beginning with the actual social-physical context. The site is the London Anatomy Theatre of the Company of Surgeons, whose walls, as Hogarth faithfully demonstrates, were framed by the skeletons of two actual felons, Cannonbury Bess and Country Tom, executed in 1635 for robbery and murder. The insignia of royal power hovers over, above everything, while the throne-bearing and authoritative figure presides over the process, directing things by means of a pointer. Insignia, throne, and setting all deci decisively link anatomy to the exercise of state power, one inscribed by colonial and racialized motifs. Turning now to the corpse, known as Tom Nero, we detect a number of curiosities. First, the anatomized villain still has the hangman's uh, rope around his neck, a clear suggestion by Hogarth that, far from having ended with death, the punishment continues with the anatomy. Note next that the victim's entrails are being funneled into a barrel, and that whatever parts of his innards spill upon the floor are being gobbled up by a dog, becoming dog food in short. Indeed, Hogarth compounds the indignity by serving up the condemned man's heart, typically consider the very seat of life as the dog's victuals. Not only does this threaten lawbreakers with public humiliation, it also animalizes the transgressor by transgressor by incorporating him into the dog. Moving to the corpse's head, we observe it being raised by a dissecting tool inserted into a pulley. Pain, even after death, is clearly intimated by the grimace on the corpse's face. Perhaps more significant, as in Rembrandt's Anatomy of Dr. Tulp, the manipulation of corpse by a mechanism suggests the subordination of the bodies of the poor to the instruments of production. The corpse's movements are directed by an apparatus that obeys the wills of the ruling class, whose representatives supervise the anatomy. Staying with the head, Note the two-sided optics of terror while the corpse is being subjected to the gaze of the prying eyes of the anatomists. Its own eyes are being extracted. In symbolic terms, the poor are being blinded, deprived of means to see the world around them, while sight is assigned exclusively to those who govern social life. Meanwhile, another anatomist appears ready to dissect the corpse's feet, the organs of locomotion, of self-movement throughout the world. Two other features of the illustration are noteworthy for our purposes. First, at the back left, a single figure points to one of the skeletons adorning the hall, as if to warn potential transgressors of the fate that awaits them. Moving to the front left of the illustration, we find an even more remarkable feature a boiling cauldron of skulls and bones from which arises an ominous smoke. Here is our clearest indication that a ritual of social magic is being enacted, a reminder that public anatomy is intended not only to punish and terrorize, but also to exercise ruling class anxieties. By means of this exorcism, the social body is cleansed of the disease of crimes against property and bourgeois order. Just as the anatomists painted by Rembrandt conclude their activities with a torch, a torchlight procession, so the company of surgeon, surgeons brews a magic potion meant to, to ward off evil. The horrors aroused in the poor by dissection were thus anything but simple products of traditional religious ideas about the body and its afterlife, even if these may have played some role. Hatred of body snatching and dissecting seem largely to have derived, or sorry, body snatching and dissection, seem largely to have derived from vigorous opposition to public humiliation and degradation of the poor. Indeed, as Thomas Lecure has shown, a measurable shift in popular attitudes towards death and funerals occurs in the middle of the 18th century, when in efforts to further demean the destitute, the pauper funeral was created. Prior to the consolidation of capitalism, funerals recorded different social statuses by enacting distinctive rituals. Those of the rich and powerful signaled their subjects' elevated public standing, for example, in the number of mourners allowed and the sort of banners carried. <laughs> 
while those of the poor largely eschewing public display revolved around post-burial feasts. But as the new social hierarchies of capitalism developed, funerals were commodified and refashioned as occasions for the display of purchasing power, and thus determined by money, not traditional social standing. Burial plots, caskets, monuments, and processions all became priced commodities, indulged by the rich. For the poor, meanwhile, funerals became markers of destitution, of what they lacked in a capitalist society. Oh no! Um, I lost my place. Okay, we're good. And in seeking to penalize poverty, officials stripped away customary entitlements in this area too. While the law traditionally gave anyone dying in a parish a right to burial in its churchyard, new institutions such as workhouses, which took over responsibility for regulating the unemployed, redrew and diminished funeral and burial rights. The same officials who sought to humiliate the poor in life also undertook to, un to degrade them in death. By combining the funerals of several paupers, denying the family control over time and place and treating the deceased as an interchangeable unit of a larger group of the destitute, by depositing, depositing corpses in cheap and unmarked parish coffins, publicly displayed so that all might see, and by stacking coffins of the poor on top of one another in graves, everything was done to strip the pauper funeral of any sense of the identity of the deceased. In these ways, the authorities publicly exposed the poor in death to the very anon anonymity that haunted them in life. The pauper funeral became thereby yet another badge of abasement, a public declaration of their moral failings. Two further indignities faced the poor in death. One was body snatching, whose purpose, as we have seen, was dissection. As the corpse economy grew, the rich developed a whole armory of protections, burial at remote cemeteries outside the city's core, vaults in private chapels, triple coffins, wood lead wood, guards hired to protect their graves. Indeed, 1818, the year the first edition of Frankenstein appeared, also saw the marketing of a metal coffin explicitly meant to thwart body snatchers. The poor, of course, could not afford these luxuries. Their only recourse was collective self-organization. Not only did they organize to light and protect their graveyards, they also rose up against the res resurrectionists, frequently inflicting physical injury on them. The second indignity threatening the poor in death was the delivery of their bodies to the anatomists. And with the Anatomy Act of 1831, this became the potential fate of all poor people who died in workhouses, should their bodies be unclaimed. Once a punishment for murder, dissection now became a penalty for poverty and obscurity. Anatomize, anatomization was literally the last straw, the final indignity, and the poor mobilized against it wherever possible. Indeed, protest against the corpse economy became a recurrent theme in popular culture, as evinced by the remarkable success of Edward Ravenscroft's play, The Anatomist or The Sham Doctor. First performed at the New Theatre in London's Lincoln's, London's Lincoln's Inn Fields in November 1696, the play was almost permanently on the London stage for the next 100 years. The anatomist explores the dilemma that becoming a corpse, commodified flesh, is the route to money and pleasure in modern society. This dilemma is dramatically highlighted by the presence on the stage of a body about to be anatomized that rises up and denounces its, its apparent fate. Indeed, this character attacks the whole corpse economy, declaring, I had rather be a sot than an anatomy, and will not have my flesh scraped from my bones, and will not be hung up for a skeleton in Barber Surgeon's Hall. The London crowd celebrated such protests, on the stage and on the streets. This theme continued to occupy a central place in plebeian culture for the next century and a half. In the 1830s, for instance, the influential radical William Cobbett railed against surgeons, the cutters up, as he called them, suggesting they treated the poor as fodder for their scalpels, just as capitalists considered them fodder for industry. 
and in the same vein, the best-selling mid-century serial, The Mysteries of London, 1844-56, served up an enduring villain known as the Resurrection Man. So, if anatomy comprised a bourgeois weapon against violation of the laws of property in the market, for the working class it symbolized everything they loathed about the new market economy. Body snatching, dissection, and the trading corpses were proof that the monstrosities of the market respected no limits. They demonstrated that the market economy happily embraced what one trade unionist called the odious and disgusting traffic in human flesh. The corpse economy thus became a symbolic register of all that was objectionable about emergent capitalism, of its demonic drive to exploit human life and labor, of its propensity to humiliate and demean in both life and death, not content with the people's toil while living, wrote a radical in the poor man's advocate, the rich insist upon having their bodies cut up and mangled when dead.